Hello, I'm Dr. Lewis Hoffman of Saybrook University. This video lecture is on poetry and interpersonal processes, using poetry to facilitate self-exploration and self-awareness. It's been developed as part of a course on the use of poetry with death, loss, and life transitions. I do have a similar lecture on YouTube without the death, loss, and life transition context. If you've watched this video, a lot of the information will be similar, but I've worked to contextualize it more for the death, loss, and life transition context with this particular video lecture. I'm going to cover the unconscious, poetry as a way of knowing, the use of poetry of others, and the use of one's own poetry. After this, I'm going to use a few illustrations as well. Now, the unconscious is understood in different ways by different theories. Now, I'm going to start with a few assumptions that I hold about the unconscious. One is I don't necessarily, I don't see the unconscious as separate from consciousness, but rather there are parts of this broader consciousness that are outside of awareness that contain some very rich material. I also believe that the, the unconscious uh, holds, can hold wisdom and have value as well as containing things that may be more difficult. When we use the unconscious intentionally, it often can help us to deepen our insight about ourselves, including some of the challenges that we're facing, but also it can help us uncover some of our own internal wisdom. The symbols and metaphors often rely upon the unconscious, at least to a degree. When we think of symbols and metaphors, they often have multiple meanings. This is the, the power of a symbol, is that it can, it can symbolize various different things. Just as, a, as an illustration, I'm going to hold up my cup here. It's got a, a wolf on it. And I, I like to use this cup because it reminds me of the various symbolisms of a wolf for me. And I, when I think of a wolf, I think of a, a creature that is at once uh, very independent but also very pack oriented, which represents some of my own values and some, and represents aspects of myself. So there's some more evident things that I'm drawn to with wolves, as well as some things that reflect aspects of myself that have a symbolic meaning, that I, I tend to be a person who is somewhat introverted, uh, fairly introverted, but also very va much value relationships and family and community. And the, for me, the wolf symbolizes those, a deep integration of those two parts of myself. But I also find wolves to be beautiful creatures, to be wild creatures, to symbolize nature for me, and uh, in ways symbolize a, a spiritual connection in the sense that they're, they're part of nature and there's something that is, is very wild yet beautiful, very wild but yet something that can be related to. So there's multiple meanings that are held in this, this cup for me. And it's one of the reasons why um, I like to, to use this cup, particularly when I'm teaching or, or writing in different contexts like that. With symbols and metaphors, there's often an intentional conscious aspect of them. We may be uh, trying to use the symbol and metaphor to represent something, but there also may be unconscious aspects things that we don't necessarily recognize that are connected as well. We can compare this to dreams. In dreams, we talk about the manifest and latent content. The manifest content is the more evident content. And the latent content is the things that are more outside of our awareness. So when we think about my cup and the wolf, the manifest content may have things to do with what's more evident about the wolf. And the more unconscious or latent aspects may be how that symbolizes myself, why this the wolf is a powerful symbol of myself. Poems often emerge, at least partially, from an unknown place. While we often have certain conscious intentions with the poem, sometimes we might not have any, but while we often do, as we start to draw in the symbols and the metaphors, 
often other meanings will, will start to get integrated with, including some that we may not recognize. This may be more true when we get caught up in the pre creative process or feel like we're in the kind of a writing zone. At those times, the unconscious may be particularly evident for us, particularly evident in coming, coming through. Now I want to talk a little bit about poetry as a way of knowing. Epistemology is often connected with the idea of a way of knowing. Epistemology is a study of knowledge or the nature of knowledge, but we can also think of it as how do we know what we know? And that's how I'm using it largely here, is how do we know what we know? In Western society today, we often get caught up in very uh, narrow ways of knowing. We may know through science, and science is what we trust for knowledge. We may know through religion, and religion is what we trust. But our knowing can often be much deeper if we rely upon and draw from multiple ways of knowing. Poetry can illustrate some of those different ways of knowing, and maybe can even lead us to these different ways of knowing. It can illuminate knowledge that other communication styles may miss. So let's take some examples of those. Emotions are a powerful way of knowing. On the West, often emotions are, are discounted and distrusted. They're thought as something that will distort the more pure ways of knowing, as to lead us away. They, they, they're not very accurate ways of knowing. I would disagree with this. And there's a number of psychological traditions, Jungian and existential and humanistic, that value emotions as a powerful way of knowing. They help us to know about ourselves, but they also can help us know interpersonally. They can help us know about the world out there at times. Emotions uh, often get connected with intuition in certain ways, that we might have an emotional reaction. This is something that I often talk about when, when training therapists. That when uh, for a common example is when a, a client may be leery, our therapist may be leery of something with a particular client. I'll tell them to trust that. But you don't want to blindly trust it. Emotions are not as clear of a way of knowing as some other ways of knowing. But there may be something there. And often I found when a therapist trusts that emotional or intu intuitional way of knowing, that it leads them to recognizing something that was important for them to know in that interpersonal process. And that awareness can help them to become more effective as a therapist, understand their clients better, to be more helpful to them, to be more empathetic with them. We've already talked some about the unconscious and the symbolic. And poetry through those can be powerful ways of knowing, particularly when we set them aside and come back to them, which I'll talk about. Paradox. Uh, learning through paradox. We, again, tend to, in the West, think rather simplistically at times, where we focus on uh, one aspect of the way of knowing, and when, when we see apparent contradictions, we see them as things that don't fit together. But often truths are held in paradoxes, things that, uh, different tensions that are held together. Poems do a great job of holding together paradoxes. They may help us to, to recognize paradoxes where we only saw one aspect of it previously. One of our illustrations, I think we'll get to this, uh, in the second illustration that I'll use towards the end of this lecture. Interpersonal, we often learn and know through relationship. And not just through information that's shared, but through the interaction, through the dialogue, through what emerges through that. Something that's not there just through the conveying of information. And as we engage interpersonal processes with poetry, this can be a way of knowing. And poetry can draw us to spiritual ways of knowing, cultural ways of knowing. So there's many ways that poetry can be combined with other ways of knowing, or highlight other ways of knowing. And poetry, in that sense, can be a part of a very powerful way of knowing. Let me suggest an activity with this. Find a poem about death, loss, or life transition that is powerful to you. 
don't think too much about it. Just reckon, uh, pick one that has an emotional draw for you. Read the poem several times. I want you to consider several questions with this. What does this poem say about death, loss, or transitions, about the nature of them? What does it reveal to you about the nature or possible nature of these? How does it know these? To what process is it doing? does it know these? Now, often that may be emotional or interpersonal or subjective, but it will help, but it, it has a way of knowing, of going about, of engaging these things. And with you being drawn to this poem, what might it say about how you know, especially related to death, loss, and life transitions, or how you know related to emotions? So this is a different way of engaging the poem, asking a couple of questions, starting with a poem that draws you emotionally. And it may even be best if you're not quite sure why it draws you emotionally, then read through it several times, sit with it, and then connect it to some of these questions and see if it reveals anything to you. The poetry of others. We may often connect with poems of others through the unconscious as well. We're not sure why we're drawn to it. But it can be helpful to pay attention to this and think and reflect on this. It may draw us to a deeper understanding of things. Pay attention to the styles you're drawn to and what that may mean. Do you need poems that are structured or ry rhythmic? Or maybe structured or rhythmic in certain contexts. The structure may symbolize a need to contain emotions around something. Rhythm um, may, or rhyming may be a, a need to have a soothing aspect. Rhythm and rhyme, rhyming often um, something that has a soothing aspect to them. Does that help make the, the topic more palatable to you? Help you be able to stay with it? Free verse sometimes opens us up more. If, it's, if you're drawn to the free verse, uh, particularly around a particular theme, is that the need to explore, to open up? Or are you drawn more towards a narrative style that tells a story? What might that mean? Pay attention to poems, songs, movies that one is mysteriously drawn to. I don't know why. Listen to it. I will often meditate on these. Read the poem over and over again. See if I can find the author reading it uh, or, or someone else reading it and listen, listen to it several times over. With songs, I'll do this often where I listen to them over and over again and uh, Try to listen to different versions of it, particularly if the person who wrote it has different versions of it. Listen to those different versions and see if there can be uh, different meanings that, that emerge with this. These can be very powerful things in, in exploring and finding different uh, meanings for yourself, different things that you resonate with. When you recognize why you resonate with something that at first you didn't know, that can be an important and powerful revelation. It can be a part of a healing process, even at times. Now, some activities that you may try with this. These are a few different activities on this. But you might try finding a poem and then reading it as if it is your own poem and interpreting it. So often when we read poems, we're trying to find, figure out what did it mean for the author. Forget that. Let's put that aside for now. That's valuable and has its uh, purpose and place to do that. But for the purpose of this activity, find a poem you're drawn to and then read it as if it is your own poem. Is it, what does it mean if it's your own poem? You might find that this little shift in how you approach it may open up different possible meanings. You can do this with songs, too. You may know that I, this is not the meaning that was intended by the, the author. That's fine. What does it mean as if it was your if it was your own? You might try picking a poem and just committing to rereading it over time to see if this opens up new meanings. 
So for this course, what you might do, if you're taking the course, you might pick a poem and decide that you're going to read it each week through the rest of the course. Maybe a couple times a week, maybe even every day. Although I think some space to let it simmer can be helpful. But at least once a week, over a 10-week period. If you're not taking the course, you can just do it over a set period. See if it brings different things to you, based on different places you are with your emotions, coming back to it, letting, setting it aside. Your unconscious is probably going to continue to work with that poem over time. As you come back to it, see what the new meanings may emerge. And then you may try imitating or rewriting a poem as one's own. As one's own. So rewriting, you might take it and just edit it to make it fit you. Now, of course, you have to be careful with that and sharing it with others to, to give appropriate credit and, and be clear on what you're doing. But it's a way of personalizing it. And as you do it, what is the significance of the changes that you make? If you're imitating it, what is the significance of the differences that you're trying to bring to it? These are a few activities you may try. Now, one's own poems it can be good to invite the unconscious to be a part of it. And there's a, a variety of ways that we can be intentional about inviting the unconscious into our, our writing. One way we can do this is by creating a zone and mood around it. Listen to music uh, that draws it. Do some reading that connects to it, to the, the, what you want to write about. Go spend some time in nature. Try and bristle up the emotion that you're looking for and allow for that to inform. When you do this, you may find that it uh, creates a different experience and brings to light some different things. So you might, if you're doing it about a loss or transition, you might find music that reminds you about that. Well, that could be a favorite song of someone that used to be part of your life or someone that died. It could be, uh, you know, if it's a life transition, moving on from a relationship, moving on from a location. Is there a song that represents where, where you're, fr you're from or the job that you're at? Listen to that and s simmer in that before writing. Bring symbols, that should be symbols that remind you of the the person, um, or the before state, not symptoms, but symbols. Uh, sorry for the typo there. So for example, I, I've got sitting right up behind me here, something I keep on, on my shelf is pictures of two dogs that I've lost. And I have their collars up there as well, and, and still have their ashes up there as well. And so sometimes when, when I'm writing, uh, I've been writing about the grieving process, I've brought down the, uh, um, at the picture or the, the collar, and I'd smell them or set them there and, and have that be a part of it. Write without screening. Just don't edit it. Just write. But save the early drafts. And you come back and rewrite it. See how it changes over time. If you find that there's a lyric or a symbol that keeps returning to you, incorporate it. Uh, particularly if it's a symbol you don't know why. Maybe it's a symbol that emerges regularly in your dreams, or a person that emerges regularly in your dreams. That, you know, when we dream about a person, at least in my, the way I approach dreams, often it may have nothing to do with that person, but what that person symbolizes to you. So if you find that someone keeps returning in dreams, write a poem in their voice about what they mean to you, the role they played in your life. Letting it go where it'll go, but find that. If you find a poem, a line in a poem, you just keep coming back to it. Use that as a basis to, to write, maybe incorporate it in. Again, you know, if you can share that, you got to make sure and give credit there. I think I mentioned in a earlier lecture in this, this series about a, a line that uh, a, a, from a song lyric that just kept coming back to me by Bruce Springsteen. The, the line was, 
Um, and the poets down here don't write nothing at all. They just stand back and let it all be. I kept coming back to this for months and months. It just had this lingering power to me. So you might, if you have something like that, you might you know, try writing a poem that incorporates that or that is inspired from that. Even if you don't know what that line means, use it as a basis. It might draw you deeper. You might find what it means through the poem. When we come back and interpret poems, including our own, po our own poems, it's important to stay open to multiple meanings. You know, we can rely on dream interpretation techniques here. When I work with dreams with clients, one of the things I, I really emphasize is that dreams often have multiple meanings, and we never know for sure what the dream means. It's a starting point. We may find the meaning, an accurate meaning, we may not know it, uh, but it, there may be multiple meanings as well. So it's important to stay open to the different meanings of a poem, even your own and allow poems to have different meanings to you over time. This again, it can be a way of deepening your understanding of yourself. You can use trusted others and groups, but sharing it and seeing what they bring to it. Now, sometimes what they bring may not resonate with you at all. It's, when that happens, it's good to honor their meaning. Let them have that. But recognize that this may not fit with me, at least not right now. But there are other meanings that may really deepen it, or at least part of it. Maybe they, they caught an aspect of it that really helps deepen your understanding. You can combine it with journaling. So journal about your own poems. And when you come back to them, when you revisit these friends of yours, you can journal about that. Wow, this, I come back and read this poem, it strikes me different. There's one poem that I'll often use as an example of this. It's called Approaching Death. It's in the, the book Capturing Shadows. And it was a poem that was uh, originally written after a, a powerful session with a client. And the original meaning of that poem was very much bound around the client and the relationship and different things going on there. But over time, it's had some, some different meanings to me as I shared it with um, a very close friend whose wife was... Uh, was sick and he was worried about losing her, it brought a, a different meaning to me. And uh, as my own parents began to age, it, it brought a different meaning to me. And it's one of the beautiful things about poetry when you free it up to do that. But, but when that happens, you may write about that, about those different meanings, and, and see what happens when you do that. So returning to this unconscious and Intentionally engage uh, in the unconscious through symbols and metaphor. Here's another activity that you might think about trying. Think about a loss or life transition and that, that's been powerful for you. It may be recent or long ago, it may be powerful right now, or, or the power may have faded. But try and let yourself sit with that and, and let it marinate a bit. Uh, try and really engage with the emotions. As you do this, just pay attention to what images emerge. Maybe a vision, maybe a smell, maybe a taste, maybe a variety of things that, that come to mind. You're just sitting with that. Maybe something you notice on them. So maybe something that they were wearing. Maybe um, something that was in the room the day of the loss or the first thing you saw after you found out. Try and write a poem and incorporate this and see where it takes you. Maybe something, and maybe best if it is something that you didn't really notice as much before doing the activity part of thinking about the loss of life transition. If it's something new that you hadn't noticed before. Although sometimes it can be powerful too if it's, it's something that's always stood out and you maybe wondered why. Maybe you even knew why, but you're, you want to deepen your understanding of why. But to remember it so that that image doesn't fade from you because it's important or significant to you. 
Okay, now I'm going to use an illustration. And this is a, a poem that I wrote that, uh, again, is in Capturing Shadows. And it may not be as evident the connection to the life transition here. This is really more about a life transition than it was about death. It was about how something had changed in its meaning for me. <coughs> Particularly as uh, I had my own children. It was for my father. And it started there, but it uh, connected my father and becoming a father. Very significant life transitions and the changing experience of my father. Now, this is not a poem that I felt is my one of my better poems. But it is a poem that is incredibly meaningful to me. And I come back to it at times because of the meaning that it holds for me, both in my, my relationship with my father and, and my relationship with myself and relationship with my sons. It's called Brown Chair. Smooth leather, leather, buttoned down and curved in all the wrong places. That old brown chair stayed at my bedside desk, rarely used for homework or drawing. Yet each night, if the fear came upon me, I timidly come into your room and beckon you to allay the fears. You sat patiently, occupying that lonely brown chair that was not built for comfort. If you got up before my eyes stayed closed, I called out and you stayed. Each night, you stayed. Such a seemingly simple act of love, staying, being present, yet not to my own young son, timidly came to my bedside. Papa? Did I recognize this sacrifice, this act of love? Frustrated and awakened, I remember being held in your love, and I say, I am right here. You are safe now. And I know your love has become my love. There's a lot of things that are significant for me in this poem. The ending of it, for me, is, is particularly significant, recognizing that the love, both in, in style and content, that I give to my son has been so fashioned by my father and my parents in general, but in this instance, my father, that willingness to, to sacrifice and endure discomfort. So, for him, stoically, I'm maybe a little bit of a different style as I and a little more open to engage in emotions and, and value that aspect of myself. But yet, that willingness to, to endure some of those things is powerful. And as I go through the poem, I, I also think about some of the subtle things. The line breaks. And each night you stay. But there's breaks between there was very important to me. The pauses there have are just filled with meaning. When you hear that each night you stay slowly, to me that symbolizes and that brings the, the feel of the repetitiveness, the extendedness of this that it happens over and over. But the love stayed steady. When this poem was written, my father was still alive, and he is still alive. It deepened my appreciation for some of his love that I, that I hadn't recognized. And that's something I value. And now as my father continues to get older, I recognize, too, that this is a, a poem that is one I, I know that I will probably come back to after, after he has died and moved on. Because of the significance, it will preserve the love, it will preserve 
some of the memories. And, uh, so I anticipate some of the changes around that. So this did a lot of the things that talked about in the lecture. It deepened my awareness. It created a lot of meaning as well as it deepened the awareness. It, it deepened the, the relationship and my appreciation in a lot of ways. But it also was a poem that had a healing component to it in, in kind of an odd way. This next poem is a poem that was written just less than a week ago from, from when I'm reading it here. And I, I consider this still a first draft. I haven't made any changes to it yet, but I don't feel like this is, is likely finished. I wrote it after a, a school shooting. And yet, the way I put it in the, the beginning there is written after yet another school shooting. And that is very much the way I felt. And while that's not a loss that's my own, it's a, it's a feared loss with having sons that are in school and seeing the frequency of school violence, seeing how we don't seem to change anything uh, around the school violence, and, and feeling this is a perpetual perpetual fear, fear, but also recognizing the, the loss of so many that have experienced this, the children that have been killed in school shootings and other ways. There's a strong component of that in there. But in this instance, I tried to do a couple things. It's not, it's written in the the shooter's voice, but it's done so with the intention for reflection more than understanding or empathy. Although certainly the empathy is in there as well. And I, I do think we need to have empathy for the people who do these horrible things, not to set them free from responsibility, not, not at all, but um, because it, it is an aspect of the process. Uh, of understanding. The poem is called They Will Never. The siren still ringing as the smoke lingers. Frantic parents call, rush to the hospital, some to the morgue, praying for a mistake, and their son, their daughter, to be safe somewhere. Online, my name and picture top the Google searches. Politicians debate guns and whether this is the time to debate while shrinks fill the TV glow with theories and explanations. They check arrest records, problems at school and diagnoses, ponder family problems, ended relations, bullies, and the damn rock music, a generation obsessed with death. But they will never see me quivering in pain and isolation, behind a shoveled stoic stare. They won't know my heart and how pain hardened to something worse. They will never find the courage to look inside and see in themselves that same potential that somehow, by grace, they were saved from. The explanations hide the reasons, leaving me safely obscured. A clean wall for projection, because they don't, they won't know me. Projecting onto me all the evils, all the fears that keep me distance, that help them feel safe, but they are not safe. They are never safe, never will be safe. It's all illusion, hidden in the polarization. I escape away to live another day in another desperate one, whose isolation and pain at this very moment is hardening inside them. Because we, we will never see them. There was a, an intentionality that emerged in this poem that wasn't there at the beginning. It's in that last standard. That, that we need to understand the pain. We need to look in ourselves. We need to recognize our own potential for evil. If we're ever going to be able to find ways to stop these school shootings. 
while there are a number of things that personally I think are important to address in decreasing this, it's not one thing, it's many things. Part of it is looking, taking that look inside ourselves and being willing to look inside others to understand this. But this, for me, that, that search for meaning and explanation and, and the possible solution is a big part of the grieving that uh, happened last last week at the time of the school shooting. Uh, just in closing, I want to talk about tracking changes. I mentioned this in a few lectures, but it's good to, to look at how themes emerge in different poems over time and reflect on them in different versions of drafts of the same poem. For me, one really powerful example is in two poems I wrote talking about a loss uh, that occurred one night, the loss of my dog. And the line in the first poem was, a night that held no peace for me. And in the second, but I would not accept its peace. That shift from something that happened to me to something I would not accept was powerful. And a big part of the healing and grieving and changes. And as a therapist, I'll often use this to track progress that occurs in looking at how a poem or poems change over time. So that's it for this lecture.